Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Malthouse Games Podcast. My name is Delton. I'll be your host today, and with me, as usual, is my lovely wife and yellow player, Haley. Here I am. I am here. So, this is the Malthouse Games Podcast, episode number 162. We are a podcast all about board games, card games, tabletop games, role-playing games, things of that sort, dice games, and usually an alcoholic beverage. But this month, we are celebrating dry January along with those who do. And so today, we have some mocktails. Yes, we'll be bringing back the booze starting next episode. I know this is our, this is our third dry episode in a row. But I think you all are in for a treat today, and we are too. Uh, I hope it's a treat today for how much we paid for these. <laughs> so these are some mocktails from the company Free AF. I absolutely hate the name, but AF for alcohol free. They are non-alcoholic. This first one is a Paloma cocktail with afterglow asterisk. Uh, it says Paloma is a sparkling Mexican cocktail made with tequila, lime, and pink grapefruit. Named after the Spanish word for dove, this alcohol-free version is Heavenly AF with Afterglow TM. Uh, it says Afterglow is a natural heat extract that mimics the warmth of alcohol without the alcohol. It says it is suitable for vegetarians. Well, that's good to know. But are vegetarians suitable for it? It's got black carrot juice concentrate for color. Is that like a purple carrot? Probably so. Or is a black carrot just its own thing? That's a great question. I'm not sure. I don't either, but let's see how this thing is. It is 7% fruit juice, 7% non-alcohol by volume. About to say 7% fruit by volume. Well, it sounds like a cocktail. It quacks like a cocktail. It looks like a cocktail. But does it taste like a cocktail? To your health and good looks. All right, let's give this thing a sniff. I smell the grapefruit, oh. which means I'm probably going to hate it. <laughs> I just inhaled. Haley just inhaled carbonation <laughs> bubbles because she's the kind of person that she is. And I think this is me stone cold sober. Every time I sniff it, I keep getting my mustache hair over the glass lip, and then it shoves it into my nose, and then I keep getting mustache hairs tickling my nose. I can't get a good whiff. We're both having problems this evening. We're both having issues. Give it a taste, Haley. We're both what's buffering. It, what's it taste like? It is a very light pink, almost grapefruit-hued color liquid. Hazy. Oh, wow. That's a Paloma right there. It tastes like a little bit of a tequila burn. Well, that's weird. It's absolutely delightful. One of us is going to have an allergic reaction, aren't they? <laughs> Which would we'll be terrible. Out. This is absolutely tasty. I'm not a big fan of grapefruit. Surprisingly, the grapefruit is fairly mild here mm -hmm. to where it's not doesn't really taste like grapefruit to me. I'm fine with that. I hate grapefruit. I get more lime than anything. Yeah, it's very much lime. I get a taste of the grapefruit. But again, it has that tequila burn. And so if you, too, Weird. are celebrating dry January or you are celebrating dry every day, highly recommend this Paloma. It is delightful. It is nice because it's nice and carbonated, too. I'm ready for round number two already. I bet it would be good over some ice. Oh, definitely. Well, Delty Poo, what have we been up to? Well, first, before we talk about what we've been up to, I need help from anyone who's better at Excel than me, which is most people. If you're typing in Excel. If you excel at Excel. If you're typing in Excel. And you hit tab and you go to the next cell. And you're like, crap, I actually need to change the one that I was just on. So you uh, shift tab. Boom. You're back where you were. Okay. I want to type in that cell without clicking. I just want to hit something on my keyboard to go into that cell where if I start typing, I won't just clear out the information that was already typed in there. I don't know that there's a way to do it. There needs to be a way to go into a cell without using the mouse to click to get into it and change the formula or whatever you've placed, I, it drives me nuts. I run into this problem every day at work. We need one of our Gen Z listeners to send us a Excel TikTok. My sister yeah. watches those all day long. We should probably watch her or ask her. I should probably just learn to use Excel properly because I'm very basic at it. Well, here's the thing. I took a whole college class on Excel. I had to have one more science credit. And instead of taking any actual science, I took Excel. I still can't tell you what it is. I made an A in that class. Still can't tell you what it is. It's that thing with spreadsheets and stuff. You did it. Hooray! Anyway, that's that problem. In terms of what we've been up to, uh, what have we been up to? Well, first of all, we got an email from a listener. Oh, we did. We've got to address that. I don't know where my phone went. It was from Brian L. I won't say his last name just in case. Uh, he had a response to our talk on strategic diversification, 
Brian said, basically, he started to nod, a head, uh, nod his head to Agricola when we were talking about it, but thinking that Agricola is one of those games where you can't focus in on a certain area, where we said Agricola is one of those games where you can focus in into a, a single area, basically. His reasoning is if you don't have sheep, you lose a point. If you don't have pumpkin, you lose a point. And if you go hard in any one direction and max out early, you have four pumpkins? Sorry, it's still only four points. He said he was shocked when we went on to say Agricola is the ultimate example of a game where diversifying will sink you. He's curious if anyone else has responded, which they haven't. Uh, is Agricola a game of diversification or not? So that was a good question. So first of all, thank you, Brian, again for emailing me. Yes, thank you very much. So here's the hard part with this topic. It's been so long since I've played Agricola, I forgot how scoring works. <laughs> That's part of it. The second part of it is, I try to do a little bit of everything, and Haley trounces me by doing just a few things. So I don't know if the strategy is just be better. That's probably it. Maybe now that I'm medicated, I need to give a couple tries to, yeah, I don't uh, think to Agricola. You haven't played it since you've got your drugs. I haven't played it. It's been, I'll tell you exactly the last time I played it. Uh, I'll look at it here in my BG Stats app. But it's one of those things where it's a game I've tried to do. I have a sheep, and I'll have a pig, and I'll have a cow, and I'll have a couple vegetables, and I'll try to do this, and I'll try to get a profession. And Haley's like, la, 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 expand my house and plant some veggies. Hey, look, I win. And then that's just the game. And every time I come out of it going, God damn it, what is going on? <laughs> uh, let's see. I last play Jesus. Last played Agricola. Was it with Mac and Cass? May 26th of 2018. Are you kidding me? It's been almost no. six years. Now, oh, I'm sorry. We played the family edition in 2019 in January with Brian, but I don't really count that one because it is different than the base game or the normal game. Uh, you have the top score of 45. I have the lowest score of 16. Uh, the first game that was me and you together was you at 32, me at 16. Then it was me and you and Brian. It was you at 26, me at 25, Brian at 23. That was good. Uh, it looks like we played with my brother and sister-in-law. You had 45. Kelt had 42. I had 40. Jennifer had 30. And then the last time we played with Mac and Cass, it was Mac at 44, Cass at 39, me at 31, and you at 27. That was the only time I've ever lost that and game. And you were the worst of that play. I know. But every time it's I crazy. have the same strategy, I am a brewer, and I am vegetarian. Yeah, you try to get the brewer card. I don't rear animals. I just have veggies, and I don't go fishing. So I have just a complete vegan diet as a brewer. I'm just a really drunk vegan. Well, what's crazy is you've won so many games like that. So maybe part of it is my skill level, like because Mac came in and just did did work. Smoked us. It, it felt like we were behind him the whole time. So Which Mac and Cass usually do smoke us in games. Yes, they're very good at games. Uh, even Cass has said though that Mac generally wins, and it's really funny because we sit down to play with them, and they're a force to be reckoned with for sure. We need to, I need to text them. We need to, we need to see them sometime soon. If you're listening, we miss you, and your baby's cute. Yes. So, in response to Brian's email, kinda. It's one of those things where, in my experience, I've been beaten by someone who does not diversify in the amount that I do. I guess if you're playing it at the level, like a high-level gameplay, someone who's played the game 30, 40, 50 times, it's probably best to diversify at that point. And I guess that's something I didn't consider. I was coming from personal experience that we recognized. Also, what's my score compared to the average score? Is like it's 45 an average winning score, or is it a really low one? I don't know in total for Agricola. The only way I know to find that is do some weird like statistic searches on Board Game Geek, and it's a bit of a pain to figure out every time, or else I would. Go, go, gadget, hyperfixation. I guarantee you, though, that the average is higher than we normally have. Probably so. So it could just be the population that we're doing our study on. Yes, we don't have an actual control. <laughs> <laughs> we are the control and the experiment. And we're out of control. Yes, so that's kind of a problem. So yeah, so there's that answer for you. Not a great answer, but still, appreciate the email. I feel like you had an email at some point that I never got back to you on. I don't remember, and I feel bad. I'm very bad at emailing. But thank you so much for sending us the email. We really appreciate it, and we will actually get back to you after we play Agricola again. I need to do that. Yes, I'll try to, we'll try to play it again soon. But aside from getting emails, we had Snowpocalypse 2024. It was yeah. a travesty. It was a blizzard. 
It was sub-zero temperatures. The whole world shut down. Edmond did not move for four days straight. Four days straight, schools, roads, businesses, everything was shut down. You couldn't buy pet food. You couldn't buy wine. You couldn't buy bread or milk. Because guess how much snow we got? Like an inch and a half, maybe? Maybe. <laughs> maybe. <laughs> Here's the best part. Not only did it get down into the like single-digit temperatures, we didn't go negative, I don't think, but we were at like two degrees. We had single-digit temps. We had snow. We had wind. We had ice. It all came through. We also had 11 earthquakes in one day. <laughs> we did. That was the worst part. But that's the thing is like the earthquakes were nothing. 11 well, the earthquakes, big, the biggest one was 4.6. It was enough that the house shook. We were at Jenwin and Cody's that night. It was right before the cold came through. We're about, what, four miles from the epicenter? Um, I would say we're more than that. If it was at Arcadia, they said Arcadia, not Lake Arcadia. I thought they said it was at North. Well, I guess you're right. Yeah, you're right. If I'm it, sorry. If it's at Arcadia, I mean, from where we were, uh, we're probably 10 to 15 miles away, I would say. I guess so, yeah. Uh, you know, maybe maybe that's short or long, I don't know, but there was 11 earthquakes. The biggest was a 4.6. That one we felt it hit and their house just set and trembled for about 30 45 seconds, and there were 11 total small earthquakes. We had one that woke us up at like 3 a.m. Yeah. But I think that that was it, but it was the weirdest weekend of snow and ice and earthquakes and everything. And everything. And going into Walmart. I don't know if other states are like this, but in Oklahoma the two days leading up to any kind of severe weather, there is no bread and milk. Like nope. we went to Aldi just to get some veggies and some coffee. And we're like, oh, we'll pick up, we'll pick up some rolls over here. Nothing. Well, and also people are running around like it's their last ever opportunity to buy food again in a grocery store. They're just like these rabid zombie like creatures with a thirst for purchasing Broccoli carbohydrates and bread. <laughs> it's the weirdest thing. And I'm sure it happens everywhere, but it's always really bad here. Also, tornado season gets that way. Yes. But yeah, there's no broccoli, no bread at Aldi. But you know what? There were vegan truffles, so we survived. I can say confidently that we survived. Nay, we thrived over the Quake Apocalypse weekend. We did. Aside from that, uh, I've been playing Prey on my PS5, which was the 2016, 17, 18, somewhere in their PS4 game. Uh, it's really good. I like it a lot. I've been playing that. Uh, I have my drums set up to mic because uh, I've been, me and Kyle have been, as I've talked about, working on some music. And I've been back here now that my shoulders, it's sore today, but it's doing so much better. And I'm working on my form to make sure that I'm not hurting it. So been drumming some, uh, about to start doing actual practice as well. But I have a way that I can mic it up, record some drums, and actually get myself a nice little overview and recordings and things like that. So that's fun. Uh, we got couches. Yes, we got couches. Where we This is the mm -hmm. first time we've had couches that are actual couches and not either a futon or the bottom tier of a Mathis Brothers couch. Yeah, we got like one rung up the ladder from the bottom. <laughs> Started from <laughs> the an, bottom. Now we're here, six inches Ashley. off the ground. Yes. So we have a couch in the living room that's a mid-century modern style because we like it with a chase end for Haley. And we have a couch that's very basic in Haley's now office because it is a pullout couch to a queen size bed for any guests but it's no longer a giant bed frame taking up all the floor space Haley can have a true functioning office I have and an guests office. still have a place to sleep don't worry we have a mattress uh, our old mattress as well as mattress pads and stuff that we can make it more cozy but aside from that aside from surviving the inclement weather and making big kid purchases we've been playing games oh here's the door uh, it's straight ahead. It's it's a game. It's a good thing these things don't have alcohol because I've already finished mine. It was really good. I'm ready for round two when you are. Uh, it is really good. I'm hungry, so I'm definitely glad these didn't actually have alcohol. Are, are we going ahead and diving into number two? We're going to dive into number two before we talk about the game today. This is another non-alcoholic from Free AF, stupid name, uh, <laughs> Mocktail. The same thing made with that afterglow stuff. This is a Cuba Libre. Delicioso is what I'm expecting after that first one. Uh, one can is a serving. We're both about to get 10 milligrams of caffeine. Let's go! I saw caffeine. I was like, shit. <laughs> <laughs> this is bad for $7.55 on a Thursday night. They should start selling pocket shots of espresso. That's just those little Starbucks glass drink things. It doesn't fit in your pocket. 
It doesn't fit in your pocket. That's true. It doesn't fit in my pocket. Pocket shots do, but I don't want to have a pocket full of pocket shots. I want a pocket full of pocket shots of espresso. Okay, I'm not going to snort this one this time. I'm not going to uh, hoover some Cuba Libre. Yeah, don't don't hoover the schneef here. So it says there's no fruit juice in this. It says a Cuba Libre is a classic rum and cola with a twist of lemon named by Che Guevara to celebrate the uh, Cuban liberation. Some say this alcohol-free version is revolutionary AF. Gotta hate this marketing. <laughs> This marketing makes me mad, but the products have been good so far. So this one, it actually looks like a beer or a coffee. You can see a little bit of light through it. If you hold your finger to the glass, you can kind of see. That but is it's super a nice, carbonated, too. It almost looks like it's a Dr. Pepper or like a root beer in darkness with carbonation. It smells nice. 10 out of 10. There's a flavor here I can't put my finger on. It tastes like vanilla. It's like a caramelized vanilla. What did it say it's supposed to be? Rum and cola. And lemon. With a twist of... It, it tastes like a Coke with a little bit of dark rum. Yeah, that's really good. Yeah, it's like that Captain Morgan. Not Captain Morgan. What's the one that's really smooth? Uh, Kraken? Kraken. We used, to, we, we used to buy Kraken for, for Coke and rum, rum and Coke. Yes. And that's what, yeah. This is. It's really a vanilla flavor. It's I'm, like that I'm surprised how nice this, these both are. They are very good. They better be for $4 a piece. And those are on sale because they're usually like 6 bucks a piece. But you know what? You know what? I think it's worth it. What game do we play this week, Delty? So the game for this episode is one that I picked up through the virtual flea market at BGGCon in the fall. This is Curious Cargo, a game that I had wanted for quite a while and just never purchased. Curious Cargo is designed by Ryan Courtney, development by Tim Kaiser, artwork from Quan Chai Moria, one of our favorites, graphic design by Bridget Indelicato, somebody that every time I see her name, I'm like, oh, okay, that makes sense, because I always like her stuff, and rulebook proofing by Travis D. Hill and Donnie Bain. Curious Cargo is published by Capstone Games. If you recognize designers' names at all, Ryan Courtney is the designer of Pipeline, which is a game we played twice recently with Kyle, it was me and Haley and Kyle, and it made me realize how much I like Pipeline. And yes. after playing this game, I really want to play Pipeline more, but I don't want to teach your sister Pipeline because <laughs> it's a hefty game. I do think Pipeline should probably be the first game that we review twice. It's been so long since we've reviewed it, yeah. and we've had such a great experience playing it multiple times. And so I think we need to review that one again. That brings me to a random point before I completely get into the game here. There's a lot of discourse online all the time about how many times a reviewer has to play a game before they can do an actual review for it. And a lot of our games, like legitimately, we play one time before we review. We try to play two. We try to play more than that. We try to play with multiple players. It's not always that easy with life going on. However, I think only playing one time is extremely justifiable when we are in an industry of games that release so often that a lot of times people only play a game once at a con or and then buy it and then it sits on their shelf for six months i do that crap all the time and then when i finally play it again i'm like oh yeah i remember why i like this but i think one play is justifiable because one play can tell me yes i want to own this i would like to try it again before owning it no i don't want to own it i don't want to play this ever again you can get that from one play sure there's a depth from a game that you can't get out of just one play unless you're like a super genius. But I think that that's a justifiable thing and that's my stance on it uh, in terms of media. And it's a good thing I'm a super genius because that's what makes me the backbone of this podcast. Why don't you go sniff some carbonation? <laughs> so Curious Cargo, since it's designed by Ryan Courtney, the designer of Pipeline, Curious Cargo is a game of connecting pipes. Guess what? Ha ha, the same kind of stuff as Pipeline. Uh, in Curious Cargo, you are both playing... I don't even, are you just a company? Uh, do, 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 do. You're essentially just a little cargo company. You have a player board and a shipping board. On your player board, there's going to be places to connect pipes, and there are going to be cargo bays that can either be used for shipping, taking the goods from your shipping board, uh, shipping them onto trucks to send to your opponent's board, where they will go into the opponent's receiving side where you can have pipes from your little pipe connecting motor things to the cargo bay on your receiving side. So if I have a blue pipe leading over to my number four on my shipping side and I play a truck or two, whenever the trucking phase comes up, 
everything that loads and unloads on trucks happens immediately and mandatorily, which means I would have a blue resource automatically put in any empty space next to that four cargo bay. At some point when I play more trucks, or Haley could play a truck on my side, you can play trucks on your opponent's shipping sides, it would push my trucks along down that line and further up the number of cargo bays. If any of those trucks ever get past, they only go 1 to 10. If they ever pass the 10 spot, they then move to your opponent's receiving number one and will slowly work their way down your opponent's receiving side. So that little blue resource that I loaded in my four spot later on will get sent over to Haley's receiving side. And if she has pipelines set up properly to receive blue, where that blue space on that truck ends based on the math of how big the trucks are and things, uh, whenever the trucking phase comes, she could receive that gaining more points for the end of the game, as well as some bonuses. So in this game, there's two phases. Construction, which is drawing pipe tiles and putting pipe tiles on your board to make these connections. This game has a kind of unique thing, I feel like, to games, which is you can put pipe tiles on top of other pipe tiles. One over one, one over two, and if it hangs over where there's not something under it, where it basically has to lay flat, so you can't lay one halfway on a tile without something on the other side, each player has some scaffolding tiles to help support it so you can still do that, allowing you to be flexible during the game, but also reroute things if you draw better pipe tiles. So construction phase is building pipes. Try to make those. You've got red and blue in the basic game, which we'll probably play several times before we try to move to the other, which is red, blue, and purple. Uh, for the pipeline to actually move stuff, it must be all one color throughout the entirety of the pipe, but you do not have to place it that way on your board. It's very lenient. They don't have to go next to each other or adjacent as you play them, all that kind of stuff. Then you go to the trucking phase. Mandatory loading happens, mandatory unloading happens, and then you can choose play a truck down and move the trucks as you need to based on how big it is. The truck you're playing is dependent upon the card. You can play possibly two trucks depending on the cards. You can discard a truck card to gain some more tiles for building pipes, or you can discard your excess pipes to be able to draw a truck card. That's how the entire game is gonna play. So it's building pipeline connections, loading things onto trucks, hoping to unload things from your opponent's trucks, and that's pretty much it. And the game just goes from there. And as simple as that really sounds in the end, it is very difficult to be good at this game because half of it is building pipelines off of random drawn tiles and trying to make them as efficient as possible. Part of it is, trying to make sure you have enough loading spots in the cargo bays that you can load successfully and as frequently as possible because you get more points for more things loaded. And then part of it is trying to receive, if you want to at all, from your opponent's incoming trucks, which is also dependent upon how well they're doing shipping things. And there's a lot going on and a lot of things to consider with each little decision in the game. And for being a game that's so kind of strange and unique in its actions it's one that immediately like intrigued me and made me want to play it again there are some bonuses in the game which are some tokens you can get that allow you to draw a new truck and play it or play a splitter which allows one pipe to essentially turn into multiple so you can have up to the max of 10 active connections on your board uh, things like that if any player by the end of the game has either made 10 active connections, I say by the end of the game, to cause the end of the game. If they've made 10 active connections, the game's over at the end of that phase. If they have received four red or four blue goods, that's going to end the game. Or if the draw bag or truck bag is empty because like, you pull a Haley and you just keep drawing tiles to try to make the perfect little layout. Yeah. But that's it. It's a game of sending things around. But what I liked so much about this game is... Not only that you get to build these pipeline connections and try to maximize efforts there, but as you build them and you make your first connection for shipping things out, and you make your second connection for shipping things out, and then you finally get a truck to put in, you get another truck to move it up, it all slowly starts to come together where by the end of it, when you're getting a truck, you're loading three or four things, and then your trucks are moving, and you're going to load three or four things, and you can ignore the actions on a phase. You don't have to put pipes down. You don't have to draw pipes. You don't have to play a truck card. You can choose not to do those things to make the game go a little longer to try to benefit based on how well you're doing, things like that. 
But I really enjoyed that you get to start off kind of slow and ramp it up. And as you're ramping it up, you're recognizing it. You have a little bit to load. And so there's a couple trucks getting a few things and it slowly just gets more and more. And I don't know, there was just something fun and intriguing in the way that I had to think about my turns. I had to math out what I'm sending you, when it's going to get to you and what you're sending me and where it's going to land in case I wanted to try to have pipes to receive. And that was one of the really interesting aspects. It was really interesting and also incredibly difficult. And I, I'm really looking forward to playing this one again because I have a few other strategy ideas. Delton won. Yeah, I did. I won. You smoked was it, me. Was it, how bad was it? I think it was at least 10 points, wasn't it? That's a good point. Let me pull it up. It was our last play. Oh, it wasn't 10 points. I had 26 to your 19. Okay, so seven points. Yeah. So I was so busy trying to make the perfect pipeline to produce and to receive that I never received once. Not one time. Yeah. You really have to be flexible. Yes. And I think that was a mistake that I made. I created my pipes to be perfect because I, I think I was thinking more like pipeline. Okay, yeah. this is going to be efficient. This is going to work. But I neglected to take into consideration the fluidity of the receiving line. And so there's many times whenever Delton is pushing trucks along, but every single time my pipes lined up with his goods, it was swapped color. And I did not create my pipes to be able to be flip-flopped very easily. That's the key here with being able to stack things on top and uh, place new pipe tiles on top of old pipe tiles, then that is really going to be helpful to make sure that you can get things accomplished and be flexible. There's even a designer note. Consider building the shape needed through stacking instead of waiting to draw the perfect tile. Why don't you shut the hell up, designer? Do what I want. Just kidding. That was mean. No, that's okay. Uh, here's the good thing. There's no limit to how high you can stack them that I can find in the rulebook either. So you could really do a lot with that depending on how well you play. Don't tell that to Kyle. I won't. We'll have to show this to Kyle, even though it's only two player. That is one thing I should have said probably is it's only a two player game. Uh, there's the three night color variant, which is the three colors. And then there is also we played on the recommend recommended first player board. So each player has the player board labeled one. There are a total of six. So you can change it up and, and alter the difficulty based on how many resources you've got, which player board you've got. Uh, and that's going to dictate several different things, which really just comes down to how easy it's going to be to build efficiently, how many resources you need to ship before the game ends, because that could be one of the end game triggers, things like that. And when I say don't tell Kyle that, Kyle will make it his own game to make the tallest stack of usable pipes. Yes. Somehow he will make like a 15 tile tall pipeline and he will win the game. It's actually very true. But yeah, I mean, that's really curious cargo. It's not too crazy. It's things we like. Build some little grids, try to, you know, intercept your opponent's stuff. But there's just something about it that was really interesting and neat. And I liked and I'm glad I picked it up at the uh, at the flea market. I don't know how much it is retail, but it is definitely still available and something you can look at and buy. So if you're interested, I say go for it. What I liked about it is the very indirect interactions. Hey, what can I get you? I'd like a topic. Any special way? Make it a top shelf topic. Coming up. Enjoy. So the topic for today, we wanted to do indirect player interaction. I know we've talked about positive player interaction on episode 137 with beer and bread, but indirect player interaction was something a little bit different that also just really worked well with Curious Cargo. So as Haley said, she liked the indirect player interaction. I did as well. And what that means for this game is that once you've loaded things onto your, I almost said ships, onto your trucks, and you put some more trucks into your, uh, on your shipping side and it ends up pushing trucks out, they go to your opponent's receiving side. Your opponent receiving your trucks, as well as you receiving your opponent's trucks, you don't have to do anything with that. You don't have to change what you're playing. You don't have to build any receiving lines if you don't want to. But that sort of indirect interaction just happens and gives you the opportunity to plan based on what your opponent's doing and makes you care about what your opponent's doing, where they're building, what size their trucks are. And it's a really nice indirect interaction in that everything they're doing doesn't affect you directly. It's not a one-to-one -one thing. They're not messing with your pipe tiles. 
but what they're doing and where they're placing it makes you think about where you're placing yours and how big the trucks are and things like that. So that can affect how you're playing the game. Yeah, so indirect interaction is another player can take an action, they can do something that can affect yours, but it doesn't directly affect it. It doesn't knock over any of your tiles, doesn't steal anything from your board, it doesn't necessarily block any move that you're going to make, but it's something that they do that has an effect on your player board. Yes, and one of the things to consider here is direct player interaction. We classify as... Uh, essentially any game where you have armies and your armies fight and you lose units. That to me is like the epitome of direct player interaction. I'm attacking you. We're going to fight until someone's the winner, whatever. One thing that needs to be said, A, these definitions are our definitions from Googling a little bit and kind of talking about things. B, because it's not just one thing that needs to be said. Uh, B, interaction is on a spectrum. It's a scale. It's not, there's only indirect, there's only direct and there's only no interaction there is a huge scale there and some things can be one more one way or more the other but still have elements of each so just fyi don't be mad at me that's all but in this game that's indirect player interaction we immediately started thinking well what's another game with indirect player interaction and to come back to ryan courtney's other game pipeline pipeline to me has a great indirect player interaction in that you care about what your opponents are producing oil-wise. Because if they're producing and storing lots of high-level oils, uh, orange or blue or gray is the other color? Yes, gray. I think. Uh, if they're producing these oils and they're going to go sell it, you have to be in, keep an eye on that because you can say, okay, cool, hey, they're going to go sell that, which means I'll have an opportunity to buy some more cheaply because there's more in the market. And that will affect how you play some. If you see someone that's going and buying up all the orange oil and you're like, well, shoot, they're buying all of that. I should shift away or I can now sell the little bit that I have for some money to then buy blue and be able to make some money there because they've manipulated the market so much. They're not directly interfering with how much oil I'm producing, how much I keep, anything like that. But they are changing this market, which will affect my decision making in the game. So I thought that was a nice example of an indirect player interaction. Absolutely. And I feel like another one is fit to print. And again, with fit to print, you don't steal anyone's tiles. You don't affect their newspaper. But Delton pointed out earlier that whenever somebody is ready to print, that suddenly puts a time limit on how much the other players can do. Because you're waiting in that game. You're waiting to be like you want to go quickly and be the first person to claim fit to print because you're going to get the most points or whatever uh, bonus. But if you're waiting and you can potentially get one more tile, you can potentially figure out the more efficient way to put these on your board to make it work. And any kind of game that has that sort of timer where if somebody decides that they're done, they're going to get a bonus, but they're also then going to make you kind of scramble a little bit. Uh, and I thought Galaxy Trucker was another one kind of like that, where Galaxy Trucker, as you're building, there's a timer, and when that sand timer runs out, you don't have to flip it until you want to. One player can flip that timer and make everybody else go, okay, he's more confident. What do I need to do? They're more confident. Oh, no, she's going to flip it again. You just never know. And so I thought fit to print, yeah, that's a, I think that's a good indirect interaction as well because it doesn't affect your ability to actually play, but it affects how you're going to play, how quickly you're going to play, and how efficiently you're trying to make things work. And the last one you pointed out was Race for the Galaxy. Yes, I was doing some reading on this topic and Race for the Galaxy and just along the same lines, Terraforming Mars, Ares Expedition, uh, Broom Service, I think has this some, um, and Puerto Rico as well, but it's the I play, you follow, where one player chooses an action and everybody else either has the option to take that or sometimes gets a bonus for the, that happening or it's just everybody else gets to do the weaker version I think that that, now this could start to teeter toward adding a little direct player interaction, depending on the game, but I like it as what I consider an indirect because you're literally getting a free action from somebody else based on what they're playing. They're not harming you with what they're playing, but you get the benefit of doing that and helping yourself play. So it's, it's kind of further, further in the middle or toward the middle than those others, but I still think that that is a better example of indirect than it would be direct for sure. Speaking of being in the middle, 
we're in the middle on if ethnos counts for this topic. Yes, we talked about ethnos. Did we? Oh, we didn't review ethnos. I don't think we reviewed it. Okay, well, I really like ethnos. I bought it. Uh, there's a new version. I can't think of what it's called. I don't like the look of it, and it's also very expensive compared to just finding Ethnos. Ethnos is an area control game where you play cards. Uh, on your turn, you can draw a card, either from the face-up discards on the table or from the deck. And to put any of your control discs into a region, you have to make a set of cards, either all the same race, troll, gnome, halfling, giant, whatever. Elf, I think, is one. or you can have all the same color. The top card of those sets, when well, you're going to lay them where you can read the name of everybody, the top card is the leader. The color of that top card will dictate where you are placing uh, the piece, I believe, as well as the ability. And I think there's some, might be some fudge room in there, I'm not, depending on the abilities. I'm not sure. It's been a second since I played now. But the only thing that you're messing with other people is just you've got more control in a region. All that means is they have to play a bigger grouping of cards to add another control to that region. That's it. And I can't remember, because the two-player game or versus a larger player game, it changes because I think the two-player game, you care about how many total discs, but in like a multiplayer game, I think you only have to care about how many of the most or of yours or something. I'm not sure. But anyway, that the, all this to be said, you don't really have anything bad happening. It's just that you're either going to get first or second you just have to make sure to play a bigger grouping to have control or have, uh, be, yeah, to be able to add control to that region. I see this as closer to the indirect side of player interaction because, yes, you're affecting how big my groupings are or how big they need to be to add control to, you know, whatever region it's in, but you're not affecting how many I have there, how I'm playing the cards, what cards I'm playing, anything like that. And, it actually might be helping because the bigger groupings of cards are worth more points at the end of an age. And I disagree because I think it's more on the other side of the spectrum where there, it is more direct and kind of for the same reasons, but uh, I guess a different perspective because I, I see us having to battle for control or dominance in a region. Like I see you starting to collect, uh, you know, little tokens for the blue region. Well, by God, I'm going to try and collect that too. That's worth a lot of points. And so I see that as more direct. And so, again, same situation, just different perspective on it. Maybe I put more weight on that than you do. Maybe so. And that's that's one that really shows that it is a scale, a spectrum between indirect and direct. But there's also a third choice, which is zero interaction. And my favorite example, because we had another game that I think you could argue has a teensy bit, but I think my favorite game for zero player interaction is number nine. Absolutely. Literally, you flip a card, it tells you a number, everyone grabs one of those because there's exactly enough for a four-player game, and you put it on your little thing, your little tableau building of different numbers, and you don't change it, you don't mess with anybody else, you don't care about anybody else, you're only doing your own thing, it's a group puzzle. The only interaction that you'll experience is whenever a Delton is watching what moves you make and copies it. I don't do that. <laughs> I have not done that. You sure about that? Yes, I'm sure about you that. Sure about Unless you put two pieces together and go, oh, they fit like that. That's the only time. But that's just because it's helpful. But yeah, so there you go. I think indirect player interaction is my favorite. I think it's more interesting. And I don't have to get frustrated at take that mechanics. Understandable. However, I still like good war games. Yes. Or good good conflict games. Uh, but it just that, that just depends. You like me kicking your butt in War of the Ring. You won't play it with me for a second try. That's why, you turd. <laughs> But I think that's it for the topic. Let's go to the question so that way I can start editing and you can start dinner because I'm hungry and it's 8.23. Let's do it. And now, join us for a Malt House Games podcast special bite-sized question. So the question for today's episode is, what is your favorite snow day activity, Delty? Now or as a kid? Now. Okay. You're still a kid. That's true. Um, I don't know. I just like to play in the snow. You do make good snow angels. Yeah, I just like playing in the snow, that's all. But really, we haven't done that in a long time. The main thing we've done is walk and get margaritas and try not to fall in the snow on the way back. Yeah, that is my favorite snow day activity. I like, we, we have a little Mexican restaurant that's right outside of our neighborhood. And so whenever it snows, Delton and I like to go on a little snow hike to go get some chips and salsa and a chimichanga and share a margarita for two. That should really be a margarita for four. 
Now, we did not do that this last weekend because it was zero degrees for about four days. And even though it's right outside of our neighborhood, that's still a solid 10-minute walk, which is not a healthy temperature to be outside for for very long. The warmest it was was like 15, 17 maybe? Yeah, for like an hour. (laughs) Yeah, it was like one of the days got up in the teens. The rest of them were single digits up until this week during the work week, and the snow's gone by then, so... I have to say, this weekend, uh, my favorite snow activity, favorite snow day activity was just being cooped up inside and reading. Yeah. I had two full days where I would read until I got sleepy, took a nap. When I woke up, I picked up my book again and read. And I have, I'm on my fourth book this month. It's the 18th of January. Fourth book for the month and the year. And the year. Yeah, which is crazy. It was nice staying inside. We got to just watch TV and I played a lot of Prey and we played curious cargo and i drummed and we've made food and it was just a nice snow day time inside yes very grateful for that and very grateful for our patreon backers thank you so much to alan jennifer and cliff for backing us on patreon at 11 which you get shouted out on the podcast if you want to be like them head to malt house games uh I'm, i lied don't do that head to patreon.com slash malt house games and you can check those things out thank you to all of our amazing patreon patrons if you want to send us an email like Brian did about our last topic, you can send that, that to contact at malthousegames.com. If you want to reach out on social media, we are at Malthouse Games. Very inactive on social media in terms of posting, but I am on there pretty often on Instagram because Haley and her sister send reels and messages and whatnot. So, A lot of dumb stuff. Uh, Instagram is the most active. Twitter is pretty active. Facebook is never And my Facebook is non-existent and my Twitter is dead, but I'm on Instagram. There you go. Follow me at... Oh, there you go. So you got... No, follow me at... S-Q-U-I-R-R-E-L-L-Y-G-E-E-K. Faster. No, that is at Squirrely Geek. (laughs) That is Haley's handle. You can find me. I use the Malthouse Games page for everything. I don't use my personal anymore. You can find it. I won't be getting on there to accept anything. So just do the podcast one. I think that's everything. Until next time, sit back, relax, grab a drink, and play some games. We'll see you folks next time. Bye. Bye.